Hello, thanks for taking the time to learn how you can maximize profits with merchandising. I'm Neil Daly, Vice President of Product and Merchandising at Broadway. Now, those who know me would say I'm a pretty passionate guy when it comes to small business. It's not just because I love local restaurants and shops. I'm a small business advocate because I truly believe small business is the heartbeat of our communities. Your flooring business and all those other small businesses on Main Street are the job creators and the people who reinvest back into your communities. You make your town better, like my town. My hope is that you'll use this training because maximizing your profits doesn't just help your business and your family, it also helps ensure that your community thrives, that your customers will always be taken care of because the business is continuing, and that the kids' soccer team has a sponsor. Our communities are better when you're successful. So I'm going to push your thinking a bit today. It's not comfortable, but I'm going to ask you to be open-minded during this training because some of what I'm going to share is very different than traditional flooring retail. And there's going to be a couple pieces in there that's probably going to hurt a little bit when I share. But the fact is, most flooring stores have not evolved since the 80s or 90s. Meanwhile, the customer has dramatically changed. Their expectations of how to buy has changed dramatically, and our flooring businesses have to evolve, or we're going to be displaced by companies that will create the user experience and the ease of purchasing that that today's customer not only wants, but expects. So please, be open-minded. Note that the items you can implement immediately are, should be at the top of your list. Create a list separately for the things that's going to take a little bit longer to complete. But most importantly, once you've created that short list and that bigger project list, get started with making these changes. Or as what we at Broadly like to say, do the work. So let's go ahead and get started. What we're gonna be talking about today are the four ways you can maximize profits with merchandising. Again, I'm Neil Daly, uh, Vice President of Product and Merchandising here at Broadloom. And I've had the distinct pleasure of working in the flooring industry for 31 years. Now, during the first 10 years, I was in retail stores and retail management and leadership with multiple locations uh, that I oversaw. And for the last 20 years, I've had the luxury of working with locally owned flooring stores. Now, during that time, I've also had the amazing benefit of mentors that were some of the leading retail designers uh, and strategists. The, the amazing mentors include Christian Davies. He's the guy that created the brand strategies for Starbucks, make, continue to work with Macy's, REI and others. I also worked with Edward Lehman, who was the brand strategist for Pottery Barn, Restoration Hardware in California Closets. Now, I mentioned this not just to give those guys proper credits for all that they've done, but I mention it because the brands those guys created do something very different. If you've been to one of these stores, you can picture the products, you can picture right down to how you felt in that store. The products and feeling you get in being in those spaces is definitely elevated. And that's not something that's easily done. You felt good when you're there. And if you made a purchase, you really didn't mind paying the premium for that product. It felt worth it. And if we could somehow transfer some of that feeling over to your flooring stores, I can't imagine how much more successful we can be going from commoditization experience of just product and price to something that is more Starbucks-like where customers are willing to pay for that better experience. During the last 20 years, I've had the chance to visit hundreds of stores, literally. And I've seen amazing stores that implemented tools like Apple stores and Starbucks and Macy's to create that different experience, but they're in the minority. The vast majority of stores that I've visited have not evolved 
most of them get stuck at some sort of purchase plateau that they just can't push through. Or worse, they go out of business because they just can't continue to fight on price alone because they never focus on elevation of the user experience. They sell down into the buying cycle. When you sell less expensive goods and at tighter margins, it's a death spark. And now that I'm again at Broadway, I have all this data that unequivocally, unequivocally proves that if you do certain things as part of the buying journey, customers absolutely are paying more for their purchases. And they'll actually like that going so more than just commodity. So last thing I'll share here before we get started, fun fact. I'm the guy who, when they need an expert for flooring from New York Times uh, and the home improvements and help sections, I'm their uh, their bloggist. So uh, let's get started. The agenda um, that I'm going to work on today is really four areas. Um, what is and why focus on merchandising? And that's where we're really going to talk about what are those four things you can directly impact? Then I'm going to get into some of the more granular details, the elements of merchandising. What are the little things that you can do that add up to a very different feeling in your space? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about space planning and the design at a higher level. And of course, as we go through the training today, please put your questions in the chat box on the right-hand side um, so that when we get to the end, we'll certainly answer all of your questions that you drop into there. Um, so let's jump in again. What is merchandising? And the guy who's been doing this for 20 plus years, I still have to explain it to friends and family too. What is merchandising? Well, the short answer is, is how we as retailers connect products to the customer in a way that increases close rates and profits. And that last piece is really important. It's not just about making a pretty show. If it doesn't create more profits through higher gross profit margin or higher average job size, it doesn't matter. So that's all we're going to talk about today. Because merchandising and business overall, I look at in five areas for improvement. The five levers you can pull in business are how many leads do you get and what is the quality? Whether it's investments into it, but we're going to talk about how you can do it other than direct marketing spends to create more repeat and more referral like the Starbucks. People that are advertising that brand so that they don't even have to. Close rates. Once you determine how many actual customers you can get through that front door, how many are going to buy from you? Once you figure out how many of those will buy from you, how much can you get per transaction? What's that average job size? How high can you push that? Gross profit margin, of course, percentage of profit coming out of the business. And then the fifth lever is a business owner that you should be focusing on is expenses. Now, again, merchandising hits the first four easy. Because again, a great showroom will absolutely create a user experience that people will talk about. People will send friends, family, business colleagues to your store if you do something better than the rest of the people in your community. And it's not that hard to be better. Close rate. If you use some of the tools we talk about here, specifically, I'm going to talk about the visualizer and sample ordering at the end, your close rates will go up because you're able to take all these options that the customer can still feel very overwhelmed with and bring it down to one obvious choice. And when you simplify it to one obvious choice, more customers say yes than not. We're going to talk about how to grow that average job size higher through upgrades and add-ons that are simple investments and very inexpensive investments in your showrooms. And when you get that higher average job size and this proper experience, you're going to grow your gross profit margin. Again, it's the Starbucks versus the gas station coffee. People will pay the five and six bucks for the Starbucks coffee versus the $1.59 
down at the local gas station. They're both decent coffee, at least my local gas station is, but it's a very different profit for that each of those businesses. So how do we be more Starbucks alike? And I don't even like Starbucks, so forgive me for using that analogy. Um, the elements of merchandising that create a very different user experience. I'm going to break it down into the details. But first, let's talk about, unfortunately, what is bad merchandise. Because before we really explain what is great, let's talk about what you've probably got some of these elements in your store today that are very quick and easy changes that you can make for immediate impact. First, the driver for bad merchandising is because we probably inherited it or we didn't have a good model to go through. Look, there's lots of store owners that I work with over my career that said it's always worked, so why the heck should I ever change it? Because again, your customer changed. If all of your customers have white hair, you're not reaching that next generation of customers and eventually that business isn't going to survive. So you have to make changes with an inherited structure. What, when I say inherited, I mean your second or third generation, that's obvious, you may have purchased the business. But inherited also means you didn't have a better model to, to look at. You, maybe you are the first owner of this business, but you built your store like you've seen every other flooring store built because there's so few role models out there that does it right based on the current consumer. Very few showrooms today look anything different than it did back in the 80s. Because when I started in flooring in the 80s, there was only three options really for any floors, carpet, wood, and tile. Yes, there was sheet vinyl, but very few places did sheet vinyl go in a home. So setting up a showroom was easy. The tile goes over in one corner, the wood goes over in the other corner, and the carpet's across the whole front of the store. Because it was easy, but with today's technologies, we still are doing it the way that 80s and 90s businesses did. We're putting laminate with laminate, vinyl with vinyl, wood with wood, and all we're doing is confusing the customer because he or she has no clue what's the right floor for their house. If we think differently around how we arrange our showrooms, we can make it really easy. The biggest one here, guys, and this was this was me, okay? I had the biggest fear of loss when a rep came in with a display that was a free display and everybody was getting it in town. I felt that I had to get that display too. Somebody comes in looking for that product, I've got to have it. More options are better, right? Unfortunately, it's not. And there's countless studies that prove that that fear of loss drives us to shove so much stuff into our showrooms and it has a very negative impact on our success. We lose sales a lot because we shove all this extra stuff in. And I'll use a couple examples today to prove that to you. Yes, I'm gonna poke fun at stacker displays a bit. Manufacturers love them because they're so cheap. I can build a stacker display for like 20 bucks. Now I've got to stick my product samples on top of it. We're off to the races. Um, and I can drop this in every store in town. The problem is it's in every store in town. And yes, it's probably the worst display ever made that didn't hurt somebody. And I know somebody is going to say, but Neil, I actually hurt somebody or somebody got hurt in my store because of this. It's not the display that's the problem. This is the problem. This is what we as retailers do because of fear of loss, or we think it's the right solution because that's what we were showed. I did it. But what we're doing and putting all these stackers side by side is making the bulk of the samples completely inaccessible. You can pull the seat first sample out or maybe the second one. Beyond that, you can't reach it and have the strength to lift it up and out. If we left room, you put two stackers beside each other. 
You leave enough room on each side of that pair of displays to pull the samples out before you drop another stacker beside it. Now all of your samples have become accessible. You actually dramatically increase the number of viable options that you can work with by taking a third of your stackers out of your store, just opening up the space or 50%. Now you can get to the whole color line, just not instead of just the two in front. The second thing it does when you do a wall of product like this is you make a lot of your showroom cut off to your customer so they can't see beyond what's right in front of them. We've all experienced it. We go into a customer's home, we're doing an install uh, of a floor, and we see another company there doing another flooring type. And the customer says, well, I didn't know you did tile or I didn't know you did wood. It's because of how we closed off our space visually with prop for most of the time it creates that. And the overwhelming nature of putting product after product after product in a row shuts customers down mentally. They don't want to make a purchase when there's no clear win. And I've been guilty as anybody of leaning samples up against displays all over the place. But to the customer who's bringing a stroller into the store and thinking that what's that sample going to do if it falls and hits my child, they're, we're not creating a space that's customer centric and we need to, okay? Clear choices, open and airy, and you don't have to spend a bunch of money to get there. The study that I referenced was actually done by Stanford. This one they did in partnership with Publix and a large grocery store chain, if you don't have one in your area. And Publix paid Stanford a very large sum of money to try to figure out why Trader Joe's, which is a much smaller space, and only about 20% the size of a Publix, has significantly higher profits per store than the public stores. They did a tremendous amount of research. And what the study showed was, first of all, everything at Trader Joe's was privately made. They had their own names on products. So the customer couldn't look up on their phone exactly the price of, the, of that same product at another store and get cross shot. Private labeling, where you can be the only person in your area that has that product, absolutely gives you a distinct market advantage we're increasing your prices. If it's everywhere on Main Street, you are going to only have to match price or lose sales. So figure out how to be part of programs that give you exclusive territories uh, of product or create your own private label. A label maker is cheap and it just takes a spreadsheet. But what this study specifically showed as a second factor besides private label was they made it easier for customers to say yes. One of the tests that they did through the study was a tasting table with jams. They put out a table with 24 different options of jam and lots of people came over. In fact, 60% of the shoppers going into that store went to that tasting table to taste a jam. The problem is, is when you counted up the success rate, it was 1.8% of customers actually bought. There were so many options there and nothing really stood out as a clear winner. They did the exact same study with only six options. And yes, with six options, less customers stopped at the table. But 12% of the customers that walked into that store bought that jam brand. So I mentioned this because we do this every day in flooring stores. We shove 24 options in front of the customer instead of six, thinking, or through fear of loss, that that's going to help us close more sales. The hundreds of stores that I've worked with and remodeled, and we go through and remove about 70% of the SKUs, and we do polling for customers before and after. And this one thing that really resonates is the customers say, 
oh my gosh, there's so much more to look at now. There's so many more choices with this remodel. In fact, there's 70% less skews. The difference is now the customer can see past that jammed up display right in front of them. No pun intended, it's jammed. <laughs> but it allows that customer to then take in what's in the space instead of getting overwhelmed with what's right in front of them. We're not here to sell you jail, folks, but if you're shoving too much into your space, you're not creating more sales. It's having the opposite effect. Please, as I take you through this, think about what can you start removing to have an immediate reduction in skew count, but still give you enough choice. Great merchandising does the opposite. It creates the inspiration, which is, I'm going to talk about the specifics here and how you should be leveraging imaging. It allows you to feel ownership. I'm in the space and I can picture myself living on this new floor. We're going to talk about how we can leverage visualization and sample ordering and things in bit to do that. But here's another big one. Today, with so many different options that to the customer just look like wood as an example, it's so hard for the customer to understand which is the right one for them. We're going in a different direction with most stores today. Instead of just shoving laminate with laminate, wood with wood, we're seeing higher success rates with stores that separate their showrooms based on these four criteria. And these four are what every retail business does today. What these four things are to create clarity is performance, style, luxury, and value. They put their high performance products in one area. They put their high style, the high fashion type products in another. They shove their luxury materials into a separate area and their value over to another area. And what this does is it allows us to ask the customer what's important for their project without having to ask what their budget is. That is the number one hated question by all customers in all retail environments today. What's your budget? Most don't know or they don't want to share it for fear that you're going to try to spend more of their money than what they really need to. But if we segment our showrooms into these four areas, then when a customer tells us, I'm looking for value products, I, I I'm selling the house, literally in three months. So I just need something that's affordable. It's going to make it look nice versus what it is today. It doesn't have the customer standing next to a display that is the high-end stuff when they're looking at the cheap stuff and falling in love with the high-end that's right beside it. Um, it allows us to direct the customer over to an area and just say, what do you want it to look like? Wood, tile, carpet, everything over in this area is our value section and just have a much simpler process for the customer. That shift in how you set up your areas can have a major impact in simplifying it, especially for new art retail sales. We use this concept when I created our, my last uh, system. The retail selling system that you see here has the components uh, that I selfishly have to share are very successful. But you don't have to have this system to create amazing success today. What I wanted to show you this was because they're high function displays. Walk around your showroom right now and say, can I get to the sample? Carpet flip racks, great. Hard, hard surface displays that are a vertical stack so I can actually reach every single sample and pull it out rather than the old school stackers wing displays where the wings flip left and right like a um we're flipping through a garment rack in a, a retail store all of those things are great display systems because they're high function but i also share this to show you we incorporate the beauty the inspiration as part of the design because that's so important when the customer is shopping for flooring today guys if we're not good at making the space feel like it's inspiration, bring in a designer who came. Because if we're not inspiring the consumer 
through before and after pictures and storyboards as part of our showroom process, someone's going to beat us. Think about HGTV. They created an entire empire on before and after pictures. You'll sit there for 30 minutes, watch the show just because you want to see what happens afterwards. And we are in homes every single day. We've got to capture those before and after pictures and leverage them. Look at your uh, community designers and bring them in. Ask them to create storyboards and put together some of your before and after pictures with products and fabrics and window treatments and showcase their skills in your space. It's a great way for B2B marketing with them as well. They send customers and we're bringing them into you if you give them space to showcase their talent. Room scenes. Every manufacturer out there has room scenes. You just got to print them and use them. Visualization I'll talk about in a bit. Powerful tool if you use it. And if you still got plastic plants, that's the first thing you need to get rid of because it is so 1980s to have that uh, plastic plant. It doesn't do anything for your space other than turn your customer off. You want their attention to be on inspiration, not plastic. Plants. So enough of that. Um, big reveals matter. And this particular showroom has done an absolutely amazing job at really a couple things here, not just the large reveal, but by how they've le purposely left space between each collection. So the customer sees each section, they've taken photography that is both inspirational and product centric and room scene like and mashed it all together in a way that's just gorgeous. But it's so easy for the customer to see the product and to understand which product, you know, where one product starts and where the next one begins. They have done an amazing job here. This is a great use of wall space. And it this particular business does millions of dollars in sales off of a tiny fraction of the products that most of us show. It is the exemplification that less is better because when the customer can focus down to a dozen products, she's going to say, that's the right one for me. When there's 50 different kinds of vanilla, it's, it's impossible to tell which one's perfect. So we've got to make that less a better option. Where they left the space in between those is what's called segmentation. It allows the eye to come to a stop in, in just what they just saw before they move on to the next section. It's the focal points. It's done with displays. It can be done as you saw uh, right there with the wall features. But again, the purpose of it is to allow the eye to come to rest. We can't do that if we shove the displays side by side. And it doesn't matter if I'm just talking about stackers or if it's displays running down a long wall, we shove them tight with no space in between. Visually, there's no break. And we have to have a break. The analogy I always use is think art gallery versus discount grocery store and how we just have a continuous run of product. Um, the next piece is flooring. And yes, this one can be expensive if you have to redo it. But the couple of things that I want you to really focus on when it comes to your flooring is can your pick customer picture themselves living on it? You can't do that with checkerboards everywhere. You certainly can't do that if there's team moldings and reducers everywhere. If your contractors ha have the talent to make the finished floor be the same height throughout the first floor of a home, then that should be what's represented inside of your showroom space. Because we're mimicking what they sh their expectation should be. And if they can do amazing work like inlays and matching stone heights up against hardwoods and things like that with minimalist trims, show it uh, in your space because 
now we're creating a difference versus the folks who've never shown off that better qualities. Inspiring the upgrade in the investment with your business versus the one that has the checkerboard and a thousand team holdings becomes easy. If you point out, this is how we do business. Workstations versus desks. One of the first things I look at when I walk into a store is where are the sales professionals meeting with their clients? If it's at a desk, please note that a desk is the most uncomfortable place for customers in any retail environment. Something that feels very natural and comfortable is a neutral workspace, tables that are uncluttered and uncovered. One of the ways I can tell if the store is doing a great job of putting the customer need first is are those workstations completely clear? No jumbled up mess so that a customer feels very comfortable taking a sample, placing it on the table alongside an RSA and having a conversation about the differences. If there's no space to do that because of clutter or a lack of workstations or worse, having to take it to a desk, we're creating a really bad user experience. You can get a very inexpensive table and create a big change just by moving some of that stuff out. But again, we have to allocate space for the customer to have that experience. We can't do that with too many products, right? So it all comes back to the same concept. If we, we thin it out, we can allocate space that smarts use of space that's customer centric. If you have a visualizer kiosk, you've got to have it uh, set up next to a workstation like this as well. Um, if not, use a tablet uh, in your showroom floor and your Broadloom website to visualize her on it at, at, at least as a starter. Because once you start showing the customer what it can actually look like in their space, it's a game changer. Um, last thing I'll share here, most of our desks throughout the day, mine included, they're never going to be perfectly clear, and it is a representation of the experience they're going to have with us. So my recommendation in most retail is always going to be hide it. Get it behind displays or behind a wall somewhere so that when your customer comes in, they're not seeing that. Uh, if you have to put a bell on the front door or a camera or something so they know when to greet customers, that's cool. But it's still better than having desk shove that on you. When it comes to lighting, lighting is so impactful as we know on uh, product color, especially products that are printed like a laminate and vinyl. Less impactful on some of the others, but those two really have major color shifts. So if you don't have 5K color lighting, 5,000 uh, is the number you're shooting for, make some changes there. A lot of uh, communities have um, grants that they'll give you for upgrading to LEDs because of the energy efficiency, get the 5K lighting for LEDs, not a 10 or a 12K, which is too blue. 5K is right at sunlight spectrum, not too yellow, not too blue, perfect for, for your space. If you have to use fluorescence and they're old, the ones you've got in your showrooms, the colors change as they age. So make sure you you swap out your bulbs about every two years uh, so that the colors being shown are really great. Some space planning can also have a big impact. That first impression when the customer walks in is you've got about 15 seconds to wow them. The first thing is open up that front entryway because anything within about five to seven paces of that front door is not gonna get sold. They're the, it's the worst retail space, believe it or not, because from the time we're little, we're always little, we're always taught to stay away from the front door um, when we're out shopping. So customers by nature wanna get away from that entrance way so they're not blocking anything or creating hazards, especially if they got kids with them that could run out the front door. So open it up uh, and, we typically come into the back doors of our businesses at least once a week, change that habit, go to the front door of your business, 
close your eyes, count to three, and say, I'm going to look at like at this store like the first time I'm seeing it and look around. And you'll be amazed at what happens throughout the week and some little changes you can make. Show that big reveal every chance you get. It truly makes a magic difference for your customers when they can go from a dozen products to the one or two options that are the simple, clear options versus cons. Uh, your showroom doesn't have to look like this, obviously, but I would bet you, you could take one area and do something similar, very affordably, and you would dramatically grow the sales of the products that you do this for. The last thing I'm going to talk about here on the fixture side of things uh, is how we make the space work for your customer to be able to, again, picture what it's going to be like. These guys did an amazing job with how they show the moldings. Um, understanding if you have to use moldings, what that's going to look like is way better when you can represent it visually rather than just on a, a chain set. But the part that blew me away when I visited the store was what they did here to create upgrades. The numbers are this, 20% of all customers who buy flooring for the first floor of their home, 20% will also spend the money on the staircase if it's offered. In retail, we too frequently forget to ask for the upgrade. So what they've done here brilliantly is they force the conversation by putting it right in front of the customer as they walk in. We offer these beautiful staircases. So they ask the, the, the retail sales professional if they forget to ask, can we do your stairs too? This 12 feet of space adds an average of over $3,000 for an upgrade. This is the best 12 feet you could ever invest in for your showrooms. There's no other 12 feet of space that's going to add three to $5,000 add-on to one in five customer orders. That increase in average job size and profit doesn't cost you any more money for more leads, doesn't cost you any more money for anything that's an overhead, and you just add an average of 1500 bucks more profit at a minimum with just doing this for 12 feet of space. Your guys could build it in a day, uh, buy them lunch. Um, whoever you get your stairs from, or if you make them custom, build this tom tomorrow. Th these are the Kramers. Lance, Gianna on the left are just amazing people. That's their son, of course. The woman on the right is their custom. And I, I share this for a reason. They tell their story brilliantly. Everybody in their community knows them. They're on social media everywhere. They tell their story. They have fun with it to the point to where their customers want to have pictures taken with them so they can be in their, their, their pages as well, and they share. At the end of the day, customers buy product from people. And if we're telling every customer that we are a locally owned business, we need their, their support, just be willing to tell people, hey, your business matters to us. Please give us a chance to earn. As a small business in your community, we, we, we are dependent upon your business. That storytelling of who you are and why it matters will make a difference in your business. You just gotta be willing to ask. And they show it really well, not just on social, but they've got all their awards in their lobby, all the certifications for their installation crews. They tell a story better than anyone and they have amazing success in health care. Um, people buy from people. They've gotta hear why your brand and your market, your company, is the right choice. Now, from a technology standpoint, the luxury of data here is amazing because what we've created with supplier partners who are making major investments to help you, the locally owned flooring store, 
grow sales is unique. We launched a program uh, called Digital Retail uh, last year because what the data told us was if you take a Broadloom website and you add on a visualizer component to that business in the website, you get additional growth. It takes you from a 2 to 3% conversion rate. When you add sample ordering right down to your local dealer website, that doubles it again, driving up to 6.4% um, conversion rates online. If we're able to get way more customers digitally to connect, we need to use those same exact tools in your stores to get more impact with customers in your store and to buy from you. Here's how you do it. First, you've probably already got lots of manufacturer brands that offer samples on your website right now. With the Broadloom website, lot, as I mentioned, lots of manufacturers, which I'll list in a moment, have made this investment for visualization and sampling. Um, using that sample ordering is huge because every time you get a first contact with a new customer, Getting all the contact information from them to follow up as a lead is sometimes really hard. Hey, do you have Pergo fluorine? It, it, they call up and ask you as an example. Um, we've got lots of laminate floors. I'd love to send you some free samples. Um, would you like me to do that? Of course. Great. I, to send you some samples, I just need your name, address, and phone number because uh, FedEx doesn't uh, send out packages without. Uh, great. Now I've got a full lead capture. I've got a way to follow back up with that customer who called or sent me an email that I just wouldn't be able to follow up without that. Um, it doesn't matter if you, the samples are perfect. It's just creating a different connection. And then once they get the samples, then you can call them back and go, hey, are these, those some good options? Uh, hopefully it's an idea starter. We've got lots in the store. Can we schedule a time for them to come by? Or can I come out and measure? Using that sample tool to gather information, major win if you use the tool. And as my wife reminds me on a regular basis, the exercise bike in the room next door isn't doing me any good if I don't get on. So you've got to lean in and start using these tools if you're going to get the results. On the visualizer side, another huge win here if you use the tools. Again, first contact. Tell the customer, please take the picture of your room and bring it in with you. Because if you do that, I'm going to be able to take lots of flooring uh, products and show you exactly what it's going to look like in your room. Something really unique that we've got in our store. When you do that, a couple things happen. Number one, more people show up at your store. They'll drive past a dozen other stores or more to do exactly that experience. Second, when they get to your store, that choice of three or four options that we're typically left with when customers want to take samples home because there's no clear winner, that goes away once we start using the visualizer kiosk in store because now the customer can take the three or four samples they chose and get it to that one that looks best. And when the customer is down to just one, we can ask for more. So game changer in your store, you've got to plant the seed up front, take the picture, and you get the double whammy here in a good way. More customers show up, and then those customers buy at a higher rate. The manufacturers who partnered with us to do both of those things have, again, spent massive amounts to do so. Use the tools. Mohawk, the Dixie Group brands, all of them, those. Uh, the Haynes loyalty programs, the Liberty Home and Chesapeake, Hallmark, Raskin, Stark and Prestige, Mannington, Armstrong, Lutea, uh, Phoenix. And the latest announcement, the coming soon, is IFC, the new canopy brand. Every one of those displays, if it was my store, I'd have a little icon, a little sticker somewhere on the display that says, see me in your room or something like that to identify those products with this amazing, unique 
capability right in your showroom. Um, and also sample ordering for your customer, the swatches. That's huge when you don't have to have your best sellers out of the showroom. You can just send them a sample to their house too. So my ask is use the tools that are there. Even if the samples are a couple bucks a piece, what that investment does to get you more customers and higher conversion rates, it's the best spend you'll ever have. So in summary, we've done a lot of talking about some of the elements here, how to improve your lighting and flooring seg and segmentation, how to keep, have very neutral, simple, clear workstations. Um, we've also talked about the power of the in-store kiosk and sample ordering. I want you to take just a quick moment and think, what is the easiest things for me to implement now? What can I do the work on now? What are gonna be the ones that's gonna take a little bit longer? And how am I gonna make all of these happen? Because together, they're gonna to make you unstoppable versus your competition. You're gonna be the Starbucks versus the gas station. As we look, go back to that customer funnel. When we look at the quality and quality of leads, you are absolutely in control of that repeat and referral component of your business. When you have customers who want pictures taken with you to put on their social media to share, here's what I'm doing. It's like holding the Starbucks coffee cup up in front of the, the Facebook picture, right? That's where we aspire to get to. Um, and it takes a different in-store experience that is customer centric, not jam full of product to do that. The close rate, absolutely you can impact with a much higher success rate by using the samples, using the visualizers, uh, using um, all the things that we talked about today to simplify the customer's ability to get to that one clear choice. By taking the 12 feet to, or eight feet to build out a staircase example, or if you do showers, show a shower vignette, one of them in your store, because it forces the conversation to happen in your store instead of a, a competitor's business. Create that add-on. And we talked about it briefly. If you can find a way to show products that are not in every store, on every corner, in your street, on your street, private label programs through loyalty programs uh, are highly recommended. Um, because what can easily get shopped online and up and down Main Street becomes commoditized. Figure out how to private label your stuff if you don't have that capability. A, a little label printer makes a world of difference. So I'd love to help if you have additional questions. Um, for more information, give me an email at neildaily at broadloom.com as you see here. Um, and of course, hopefully that chat uh, box is completely full of questions. If not, go ahead and please throw it in there because we're going to move over to the Q&A portion now. Uh, and again, I thank you so much for the time that you've given me uh, to hear about some of these best practices. And for your Main Street, I ask, please, let's do it to work on it together because we know how important your success is, not just to you and your family, but to your community. Let's, let's rock it together, guys. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to kick it over for questions. So thanks again, everybody, for taking the time to join into our uh, webinar today. Uh, we've got a few questions that have come in throughout um, our time today. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the first one to come in here. What should I do if our best-selling products are in a stacker display? they also do not fit in other displays. Great question. My recommendation is first, if you have a lot of stacker displays, think about how we can take that, and I'm just making this number as an estimate, 15, and how do we get those down to 10? So we create that open space, because what you're probably gonna find is in stackers that your best sellers are going to be um, made up of about uh, 20% of your product lines, you probably have plenty of space there. 
But if not, again, you don't have to get rid of the stackers. Just think about how do we leverage the space we've got in a better way to showcase what's going to help you sell more products. Uh, there's got to be that 20% of the, the products that sell most. There's got to be some that you'd almost never sell to. So call those first and make room. I've also seen some folks um, buy a couple different types of displays to standardize the visuals within their showrooms. Uh, something that allows for greater accessibility for those types of samples. Uh, there's third party display companies. You can just go on to Google and do a search for um, flooring showroom display manufacturer. And you'll see a whole bunch of companies like Colony that make uh, some really nice waterfall displays that are very, very inexpensive if you want to look at a different way of merchandising those. Um, again, if you have any qu additional questions, please just drop them into the, the chat box. We've got a couple more here. Um, if you want to go ahead and pull up the next question, uh, what should be at the front of my store versus the back? Great question again. The, the theory has always been, one, what is line of sight from the front of your store? When I walk in, I want to be able to see the back wall and I want to be able to see every product that you represent from about six to eight steps inside your front door. Now, some stores are going to choose to put their least expensive products right up front, set that value perception. Other stores want to put some of their higher fashion and higher quality uh, luxury type products towards the front of their store. I don't know that there's a really right or wrong there. It really just depends on what you're trying to achieve with your customer. If your goal is to represent very inexpensive product lines in the marketplace today, then you probably want to lead with that. If you're finding a lot of customers that are sticker shocked, you know, you might want to lead with those value products up front with a big price sign to let them know we have those low price options too. But I'm always going to make sure that I have something that's just simply stunning on the back of my showroom that I can see it from the front, uh, if at all possible. That's the milk in the back of the grocery store equivalent. I want to try to get that customer lured back deeper into the store than just stay keeping them toward the front. So think about what can you put back there that's the bolder colors, the bolder prints, uh, that the customer just got to go check out uh, as part of your strategy as well. And our next question here, the last one I'm seeing came through, um, who makes the staircases shown on the presentation? I'm sorry to say that one is uh, custom made. The good thing is you can make that staircase really easily. As long as you figure out what you're going to show, whether it's again custom fabrication that your crews uh, make, or if it's one of the large manufacturers for stairs, um, however you want to show the product, building the actual staircase itself is really easy. It just takes some two by fours and plywood. Uh, to build that. Um, most basic framers can build that in, a, in an hour or two. Uh, so it makes it quick and easy for a project. Uh, I've had installers build staircases in my showroom as well uh, to showcase their work. And they actually even volunteered time because they knew once they got on the job site, if they could add the stairs, it added a lot more profit for them too, with less travel uh, between job sites. So it creates an efficiency for them. It helps us sell more. It's a win for both. So um, that one's not available off the shelf, but building out three or four steps that showcase the different variations of what you have in your store for options, it is amazing high return on investment space when you do that. Um, it forces the conversation around, should we also do your stairs uh, as part of this project? And a lot of those customers will say yes, and that adds so much more to your bottom line when you do. So build a, build a short staircase. Your, your, your profits will appreciate it. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions that came into the chat. Just want to check in with my partner in crime here, David. Did anything else come through? I'm not seeing that there is. So with that, folks... Again, I thank you so much for taking the time um, to join us today to, to learn a little bit about merchandising and the ways that we can try to increase profits and sales through that. Again, my name is Neil Daly, neil.daly at broadloom.com if I can be of any further assistance. 
And uh, sure appreciate you taking the time and we'll see you on the next podcast.